Good afternoon, everybody. How are y'all? Good. Uh, so I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana, so good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, otherwise, it feels lonely, even though I have an amazing set of people up here, and I'm just in awe scribbling notes. Uh, so my name is Andrea Armstrong, and uh, I'm going to do what I hope three things uh, today. So first, I hope you walk away with a greater sense of what prisons and jails actually look like inside. I've probably been in 20 or 30 of them, and uh, they are not great spaces, and I want you to feel, to hear, and to see what they are. The second thing that I hope uh, that I get a chance to do is, is ask maybe why don't you know more about what prisons and jails look like? And then third, to kind of think about and think out loud about what role law in particular plays uh, in thinking about this. So I recently testified in uh, the Senate about deaths behind bars and how the Death in Custody Reporting Act has failed to increase transparency. So for the last several years, my students and I have been filing public records requests with every single place that has bars in the state of Louisiana, that is every prison, that is every jail, that is every immigration detention and youth detention center. There are 133. Our project started because we didn't know who was dying. There was no publicly available listing of who was dying. And families would ask me, is my son the only one who's died in this way in this place? So now we know from 2015 to 2019, at least 786 people have died behind bars in Louisiana. And the reason that I think of all of these spaces together, here I have some definitions of a prison versus jail, the terms are often confused, but the US carceral system includes prisons, jails, immigration detention, youth prisons, and youth detention centers. They're operated by your local municipality, by state, by federal, and there are so many similarities among them even though they are sometimes treated differently by the law. The key similarity for me is within these spaces, government authority is at its absolute highest and individual rights are at their lowest. And so I want to show you a quick, uh, short video of something that I found in the House of Detention in the New Orleans jail. This is an isolation so the audio is hard to hear, but what you'll hear is this is a solitary cell. So as you heard from Professor Resnick, they said, you know, seven by 14, this is six by nine, and most of that room is taken up by the bed and the toilet. I was born and raised in New Orleans. I had no idea that these five cells on the second floor of the House of Detention existed, much less that people were in there for months at a time. Over the last decade doing this work, I've started thinking about it in terms of transparency, but more and more, I am becoming convinced that this is an issue of secrecy. So if you just think about the most recent movements we've We've had laws and policies around criminal justice reform. We see that all of the efforts had focused on pre-incarceration, so reforming arrests, police practices, doing diversion courts. There's also back-end reform, thinking about re-entry, collateral consequences of your conviction, but not a single one of these reforms have talked about conditions inside. This is a psychiatric cell on the 10th floor of the House of Detention. I am standing there literally turning in a circle. I haven't moved my feet at all. I've now moved all the way to the back of the cell. Bunk to my side wall, toilet, and sink to my left. And 
and again, this is not even a solitary cell. This is the place where they put people who they acknowledged needed significant treatment for mental illness. Also note, you saw the tear there. Think about the visibility and the staffing, right? So if someone is suffering from mental health uh, issues and they are experiencing a crisis, how do they signal that crisis? How do they access help and resources? This is an outdoor recreation cage for Camp J, which was the solitary wing of Angola. Note that there is no shade, there is no water, there is no access to a restroom. Louisiana summers are incredibly hot. But if you were in solitary, this was the only way that you could access outside. You would get a turn or two a week. And uh, Glenn Ford, who was wrongfully convicted, spent 29 years on death row. For the last seven years that he was incarcerated, he refused to go outside because he refused to be treated like a dog. This last bit that I want to share with you about what we've determined, it's hard to read, but what you'll notice is pink. Pink is for suicides that were completed in solitary. The two largest areas with pink are juvenile facilities and jails. And so thinking about how do people in what are supposed to be the most observed spaces, solitary, there's staffing, there's uh, restrictions on what you can have and sell, how they of all places manage to complete suicide as often as they do, particularly in youth detention in jails. So I've shown you a lot, and in fact, Prisons and jails and detention centers impact all of us in lots of really important ways. People live there, people work there, people also have family members there, and we have an enormous amount across the U.S. We have more carceral spaces than colleges, and in Louisiana, we have more prison beds than hospital beds. So in what way is this then secret, right? So hopefully you've seen something today that you haven't seen before. And what I would like you to think about is that secrecy in this case serves a particular purpose. I think in fact it serves three purposes. The secrecy, one, maintains the divide. It is a way of facilitating what Professor Sharon Dolovich has called the physical and moral exclusion, right, from this category of care. Second, it's an internal ability to invoke secrecy and your own authority, right, vis-a-vis -vis the incarcerated population. So it allows you to enhance your control over people who are involuntarily held. And then third, I think it is also there for us to ensure the future existence and viability of these types of practices to control people who are held. And the way that it does it is it hides the human, economic, and social costs of incarceration. For example, there's lots of different reasons for secrecy, maybe beyond the purposes that I talked about. Could be family shame, could be a lack of care. But I also think that law is doing something special here. So I want to show you a restraint bed in the House of Detention this in New Orleans. This is HOD, CLU, North Side, First Cell in Restraint Cell. So what I want you to think about there is what work is law doing? Kane Maselli died on a restraint bed just like that after four hours. She was restrained with five points, so ankles, wrists, belly. And uh, she had asthma complications. In fact, she had asthma medication in her purse, which they did not give her. And then the doctor, though, if she had not died, 
a doctor had approved for her to be restrained to this bed for a total of, in fact, nine hours. And we know about Cain because we know about her from her friends and family. But we don't know how many people, for example, have been kept on five-point restraints in restraint beds in our jails today. We're going to come back to that picture because we're going to brainstorm what work law is doing. But I want to just simply highlight that there's three particular mechanisms that I think are relevant here. First is that the courts defer. The courts have an elaborate doctrine of deferring to the decisions of prison and jail administrators because they know best, according to the courts, on how to maintain security and order. Second, through statute, through law that's enacted by legislative bodies, whether it's Congress uh, or your state legislature or even municipalities, we see the exclusion of these spaces and the people who are forced to be in these spaces through, um, through statutes. So for example, in Louisiana, to request a public record, you must be an eligible person. But if you are incarcerated, you are not considered to be a person eligible to request records unless it is a direct relationship to your post-conviction appeal. And Louisiana is not the only state. 15 states maintain some form of statutory exclusion. And then third is regulatory omission. The rules that we do have are not enforced. So back to our restraint bed. There are, in fact, three different ways that we can talk about why we don't know what's happening. First, the judges have been deferring to the warden of the facility on what is necessary and when it is necessary. So if the warden has decided that someone should be in restraints, five points, then that is the rule that governs. Moreover, incarcerated people are excluded from Medicaid coverage, which means that the rules promulgated by the Centers for Medicaid and, Medi um, Medicaid and Medicare, those rules don't apply to carceral spaces. This leads to absurd consequences, including unlicensed or restricted licensed doctors exclusively practicing in prisons and jails. But it also means that CMS rules governing the use of restraints during treatment also do not apply. Last, you'll notice that there's no water flow in this cell, nor access to a restroom, which means that our regular building code rules around running water don't apply to this carceral space, even though under environmental litigation, this cell would be considered the equivalent of a studio apartment. So throughout all of this, I've told you some extreme stories, but the extreme stories are not the only experience. At the top, you see toothbrushes that are uh, in holes in the wall above the door. And that's because incarcerated people have found ingenious and creative ways to survive and maintain, uh, to the extent allowed, their dignity while incarcerated. And so they needed a clean place for their toothbrush, and they found one. There was nowhere else. At the same time, on the bottom, you see the masking tape. So guys, when they were in HOD and they were going to court, literally a guard would come and put masking tape on them and write on them as people, what cell they belonged to and where they needed to be returned to, right? There's invisible degradations throughout, but also enormous creativity. The top is all of the uniforms waiting for the next shipment, and the bottom, we saw this over and over and over again. It's a calendar made of toothpaste on the other side of a bunk. It's a way of keeping track of time when time has very little meaning in terms of what you see every day in your contact with your family and your friends. It reminds us that we have to be innovative and creative in our analysis and in our work. So carceral secrecy services distinct legitimating purposes and law plays a role in maintaining and enabling this secrecy through deference from the judiciary, statutory exclusion, and regulatory omission. 
This secrecy of what happens in prisons and jails and detention centers is not accidental in my experience. It is a feature, a key feature, of how we incarcerate in America today. Thank you. We wanted to pause for just a couple minutes for a couple questions, if people have them, so that we will then go to Elizabeth Hinton and uh, the judge, but we just, it, and we don't have to pause because there's more to come, of course, but wanted to be sure that if we were capturing questions if they were there. And I see Annie has identified. Uh, I'm Tom Licker. Um Berkeley, uh, Professor Armstrong, I had this talk last night about the issue of physicians and I never really got an answer. I'm, you argued that, that many of these uh, um, horrors are permitted because of this, the, the warden says they're necessary. But I was curious about the, the unlicensed physician, which seems to be very strange given in general the, 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 the strictness with which licensing rules are, tend to be so could you speak a little bit about what kind of, is a category of justification that's given for that? Or is it just we do it because we can? So I think it's a combination of different purposes, right? So first is what the medical board will say is, we believe in rehabilitation. And these are skills that are needed. But second, because of the Medicaid exclusion, right? So Medicaid will not pay for treatment rendered by an unlicensed or a partially licensed uh, medical professional. And so prisons and jails are the only place where they can practice. And this isn't just in Louisiana. This, so there are private correctional healthcare companies, Corizon is one of them, that employ partially licensed doctors. Um, and it's a practice that also occurs in state-run systems. And I should say you've written brilliantly about the practice of execution and its end. So uh, you know a good deal about the history of, uh, of criminal sanctioning. Uh, oh, please. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me, but you said that one of the problems is that, oh, there is we go. that uh, there's a deference to judges, I mm -hmm. mean, a deference by judges mm -hmm. to the uh, uh, prison officials. Is there a way to bring this to the attention of judges so that perhaps uh, it, while there is a deference, it'll be an informed deference? Yes, I, so I don't need this actually. <laughs> so I see the deference in court cases in a lot of different ways. One is they defer, but they don't ask for the evidence behind the decision, right? So a, a warden says, this person needed to be in five point restraints. Okay, well, what information did you use in coming to that decision? What information did you rely on to make sure that it was a safe practice? What information did you use uh, to determine the length of the amount of time? Those types of questions are not being asked by a judge, and states have gotten out of the habit of having to even offer them. And so I think that there is work to be done through the judicial conference, et cetera, that perhaps we might have um, some judges who are a little bit more curious than they have been in the past. I, we have one more question, and then we'll, we'll turn to Elizabeth Hinton. Hi, my name is Matt Murphy. I work at Eastern State Penitentiary Historic Site. And, Thank um, you for welcoming us. To we're see excited you. to have you, and uh, this is all fantastic. So um, Eastern State was famously uh, a tourist attraction in the 19th century, and they were quite open about inviting dignitaries and politicians and the general public into the building. And Charles Dickens famously uh, shamed them on an international scale. Uh, so do you have a, a, like anything to say about how carceral secrecy has evolved over time? Did prison officials kind of learn their lesson about letting people into the building? And, and not to say Eastern State didn't engage in carceral secrecy. They definitely did. But uh, you could buy tickets like right around the corner and check it out. So Auburn, I, Auburn too. Yeah, and the New York, yeah. New York prisons did the same thing. Yeah. So I see a significant shift in this work around the civil rights movement. When we started incarcerating black leaders across the US in prisons and jails, and they started using the organizing tactics from the outside, inside. And when we think about it in terms of that time period, it makes a lot more sense. We had public floggings, 
we actually still have the rodeo at Angola, um, which is a public event. Um, but those entrances in are fewer and, and farther between. And I think it is in part because we see this shift right around 1960s, 65, 70, in terms of um, public attitudes towards punishment, as well as the types of tactics that they were willing to use as I think we're gonna hear a little bit more around race and um, its purpose within this criminal legal system. So this is a good segue. There are, Angola is famous for the Angolite, great newspapers produced inside with remarkable writings and accounting that provide uh, enormous numbers of associations inside facilities, um, some of which are outward looking and some of which are not, and some of which are sanctioned and some of which are, are punished.